recently picked up my copy of the, uh, the history of the biochemistry department to learn a little bit more about him. And this was a chapter written by Hector DeLuca, in which he describes the, uh, the discovery of the production of vitamin D in butter and milk by irradiating these materials with UV. And at the time, the, so this led to patents, and the university's stance on patents was that they were the sole, uh, under the sole ownership of the inventor. Wouldn't that be really nice? But that was still true. But um, so apparently, Professor Steenbach deposited the royalties of this money in an account and it kept accruing until he found a mechanism that could be used, uh, that would be suitably used to uh, reinvest in this money. And this led, as many of us know, to the discovery of Worf, and, uh, in which Professor Steenbach was, was instrumental. And what was interesting was that Professor Steenbach assigned all of his patents to Worf, and then those patents um, generated quite a bit of, of income from the university, 15% of which was returned to Professor Steenbach. And after some period of time, he refused to accept any additional amounts, and this money was used uh, to create personal funds that led to the establishment of two uh, really large additions onto the biochemistry building. It endowed several Steenbach professorship, professorships, and among other things, started a symposium fund, which we're here today to celebrate. And I can think of no one's work that better kind of holds true to what Harry Steenbach did than Professor Arnold, who really blends fundamental science and applied science. Um, I'll just read this. Professor Arnold is currently the Dickin, Barbara Dickinson Professor of Chemical Engineering and Biochemistry at Caltech. She has a really interesting background that included some time at the Solar Energy Research Institute and Golden, Colorado, which I think many of us will be interested in that are thinking about biofuels. Following a postdoc at Berkeley and then at Caltech, she joined the faculty at Caltech and um, has many uh, honors, of which I'll just name two. She's a member of the National Academy of Engineering and the Institute of Medicine of the National Academies. She served on some very interesting boards, including the Santa Fe Institute, which is a really neat place, and uh, several corporations. At Caltech, her research is focused on understanding the principles of biological design. And in that context, she has used evolution to create and select new proteins, uh, metabolic pathways, and cells themselves. And these materials have applications in biotechnology, medicine, and energy in the form of biofuels. And today, she's going to tell us about her work on evolving P450. This is fantastically interesting science. And I'd just like to remind you, in case you run out a little early, after today's uh, talk, we'll have a, uh, a banquet in her honor in biochemistry in the atrium uh, to which everyone's invited. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here and to share some stories of laboratory evolution. It's my favorite design algorithm. It's employed me for the last 20 years and probably will keep me busy for the next 20. And it works at all scales. Everything in this room of any real complexity is a product of this wonderfully simple design algorithm that even a chemical engineer can apply. And I get to apply it to some pretty fascinating and complicated biological systems. And I'll be telling you today and actually tomorrow about my favorite uh, model system, which is a real, real enzyme, cytochrome P450. Um, I have to warn you, I um, am practicing biochemistry without a complete license. I did a couple of postdocs in biochemistry labs, but I've uh, not been trained entirely in biochemistry. I'm an engineer by training. And um, so my language may come a little different to you, and I hope you'll bear with me on that. Um, I'm going to tell you about a synthetic organic chemist's dream. Actually, I give this talk a lot. I talk about the system a lot to organic chemists, because here's an enzyme 
that can do some chemistry that would make your tongue hang out if you were trying to activate CH bonds. Uh, this guy can take an unactivated CH bond, mostly hydrophobic uh, small molecules, and insert an oxygen from dioxygen into that bond and do so at room temperature, atmospheric pressure, and aqueous solution. And it's really such a great model. Of course, it, it shows up in all the textbooks of what biology can do. But no one would touch it with a 10-foot pole if they're actually going to do this reaction. And so yes, we can admire the ability of this complex system to do it, but we don't actually do it. Of course, the uh, stoichiometry of the reaction requires uh, some delivery of reducing equivalents from NADPH, which of course costs about a thousand times per mole, uh, more than almost anything you want to make with it. So you have to do a little bit of cofactor regeneration and other things to make such a reaction go forward. Not to mention the fact that most of these P450s are membrane associated and pretty much give up the ghost anytime you go and try to purify them and characterize them. So they're a, a real biochemist's dream spent a lot of time doing that. So I'll be telling you about the laboratory evolution of these catalysts with the goal of making catalysts that one could use in organic synthesis, but also with the goal of trying to understand where all these remarkable capabilities came from. If you go out into nature and uh, look at the uh, substrate ranges of these enzymes and where they are, one thing that's remarkable is that just about everybody's got one. Just about everybody except for E. coli, which of course makes it fun uh, to work with in E. coli. I don't have a lot of background reactions. Uh, and we just about everybody's got one. You've got about 57 of them. Plants can have hundreds of cytochrome P450s. They're involved in the first line of defense in xenobiotic breakdown. They're involved in biosyn numerous biosynthetic pathways, natural products. And if you go and look at the range of substrates that will accept for this oxidation chemistry, you see that it's enormously diverse. It tends to be very hydrophobic substrates, but you'll see uh, everything from fairly complex structures down to uh, fairly medium chain alkanes. So somebody a long time ago figured out how to do this reaction. So we look at this family of enzymes that exist today. You can Go to this database, this Nelson database has more than 7,000 known sequences. That number grows exponentially. So last year I did this talk, it was 4,000, now it's 7,000. And next year it'll be many more. One thing we can see right away is that somebody figured out how to do this chemistry a long time ago. Uh, and through the process of mutation, natural selection, elaborated on this such that over millions of years, the 7,000 sequences that you can scrape off the bottom of your shoe or extract from plants or wherever today have diverged all over the place to catalyze these reactions. And it's quite remarkable if you think about it. They also diverged very much in their sequences so that you can have things that are 85% different and yet have essentially the same three-dimensional structure and catalyzed reactions on a very broad range of things. Of course, this is extremely frustrating. It's remarkable to think that all these different sequences can fold into the same structure, but it's very frustrating to those who would go to these natural solutions to the problem of CH bond activation and try to discern what's the sequence function relationship. So one thing we know about these sequences is that there's a very large neutral component to evolution. There's a lot of random change being made that has essentially no effect on function or very small effects on function. And embedded within this 85% change in the sequence of these 300 plus amino acid substitutions might be three or four that are contributing to the functional changes. And it's your problem as a biochemist to pull those three or four or 24 out of the 344 and try to understand why one sequence has its particular function uh, that another does not. So these products of evolution are beautiful, inspiring, but extremely frustrating to reverse engineer. All right. For that reason, um, I chose one particular family member uh, to play around with in the laboratory. And uh, a lot of people ask me, how do you choose a starting point? Well, I took uh, advice from 
uh, scientists at no design some years ago, they said, Francis, the last thing we want is an enzyme that you can evolve all over the place, but you can't make in train load quantities. <laughs> you have to be able to make enough of this stuff to do something with, to understand so that you can do the crystallography, so you can sell it, you name it. And so the reason that I chose to work at Cytochrome P450 from Bacillus Mediterium is that you can scrape, scrape this organism, it's a soil organism, off the bottom of your shoe, and you can put this gene E. coli and make gob quantities of it to study. It's also, so it's well expressed in E. coli, it's a soluble version, it's sitting in the cytoplasm, it's not membrane associated like almost all the eukaryotic, in fact, all the eukaryotic cytochrome P450s. Yet it's a, um, a P450 that shows considerable structural homology to uh, eukaryotic P450s. Even better, it's highly active. On its preferred substrates, this has a rate of up to 10,000 times uh, the rates that the eukaryotic enzymes exhibit on their substrates. So we're starting with something that's good, that you can make in lots of up to about 12% of the cell uh, protein will be, will be the P450. And furthermore, unlike most of the eukaryotic, in fact, all of the eukaryotic enzymes, which are multi-component systems, this has all the catalytic machinery it requires to carry out these reactions uh, encoded on the single polypeptide chain. So the, the reductase domain, uh, which binds three cofactors, is fused to the heme domain and everything's there together in a single polypeptide chain. So the question, oh, so what does this do? Of course, the, there's got to be some downside to things. What it does is it hydroxylates fatty acids at subterminal positions, a um, reaction of mild interest unless you're making new detergents, and of course that can be of some interest. And it doesn't show particular selectivity in its hydroxylation. So it, for example, it'll insert oxygen at any of the subterminal positions all the way up to about N minus five. And it usually <coughs> inserts only one in low conversions. So here's the question. We have existing today this family of thousands of known sequences, and of course there are many, many thousands more that haven't yet been determined. And I've identified P450 BM3, which hydroxylates fatty acid, yet I know that all these others are possible. In fact, there are many more. Could we use laboratory evolution methods, if these are powerful design methods, to create BM3 versions that exhibit any of these known activities. Can we start with a specialized enzyme today and create the functional equivalents of all the other people? And this is an interesting question because I can do my experiments in such a way that I'm making only adaptive mutations. And therefore, I can ask, well, what is the minimal number of evolutionary steps that it takes to go from one function to the other? And what are the kinds of mutations that will confer function to this? Are they occurring in the active site in the substrate binding pocket? Are they occurring somewhere else in the protein? I can actually follow the entire fossil record of an evolutionary experiment in the laboratory and see what it takes to achieve these new properties. Well, it's even more interesting. I can go on beyond, at least where we've discovered in natural systems, and ask, are non-natural activity, activities accessible to this protein? And I'll give you an example of this. It's quite interesting to be able to probe the limits of the catalysis separate from what biology cares about. Because if we're biochemists and studying the natural world, we're limited only to the products that make it through natural selection. But there's a whole world of other products out there that might be the physically possible things. It's just they were thrown away because they're not particularly relevant biologically. I'll come back to this in a minute. Now, one approach to making such proteins from BM3 would be to sit down and try to design that. And everybody says, a test of my knowledge is that if I can build it, I understand it, right? So they tell you, if I've learned enough about protein folding and sequence function relationships, I should be able to take a structure, the heme domain structure is known, and identify the amino acid substitution that will convert it into some other function. Uh, that's hard to do, and I'm not going to go into any arguments, although it's a wonderful debate that I often have with my colleagues at Caltech. Uh, I'll just tell 
reality of that in an enzyme like this, details really matter. I call it enzymes. Details really matter. Catalysis, if you look at the energetics of the improving of catalysis tenfold, we're talking only a few kilocalories per mole, equivalent of a couple of hydrogen bonds out of hundreds that might be forming. And you have to be able to do your predictions at that level of detail in order to be able to design new catalysts. We simply don't understand those details. And luckily for us, um, we have an algorithm that, that circumvents this profound ignorance and allows us to do design uh, in the same way. But before I go on and tell you how I can evolve novel functions, I'd like to also remind you that evolution is not easy either. There's plenty of ways to make mutations for protein that give you nothing at all, nothing of interest. In fact, a protein is less functional than what you started with. And I think, you know, just to give you a feeling of what the challenges are, it's useful to think of all the ways that you can string together the amino acids that make up a cytochrome P450 heme domain. If it's 450 amino acids long and it's 20 letters in your alphabet, we have got a space of possible sequences that's not even remotely physically possible. This is a space that's so large, Dan Dennett calls it very much more than astronomically. In fact, it's very much more than economically, which are the biggest numbers that humans can conceive of. It's very much bigger than any of those numbers, bigger than the number of particles in the universe by many orders of magnitude. So this is a space of possibilities that nature has explored but the tiniest fraction of. And I can tell you, I have explored myself an even tinier fraction of that, an infinitesimal fraction. Yet I will categorically tell you that most of it's empty. Most of those sequences don't encode for anything that has, that even folds into a three-dimensional structure, much less a new cytochrome P450. And therefore, it's a pretty hard place to be doing a physical optimization. In. I'll just give you some of the numbers and the arguments Experimental studies have gone in estimating what's the density of functional proteins in this sequence space, going from something like 1 in 10 to the 12, you know, Jack Shostak pulling and binding proteins out of random amino acid uh, polypeptides of 90 amino acids, to Doug Axe's experiments, beta lactose, this is the creation of side of things, 1 in 10 to the 77. Doesn't really uh, matter, you know, 1 in 10 to the 12 is pretty small when you're trying to find needles in case that's 1 in 10 to the 77 is pretty small. They're all small, so these things obviously did not come about by selection from random libraries. But of course, that leaves us with the question of where did natural proteins come from? Obviously, they came from smaller things being built up, but that's not what this lecture is about. And it should make us wonder, well, you know, if functional proteins are so rare in this space, how on earth do they evolve? Uh, because one fact of life is that most mutations indeed are deleterious. If you go and make random amino acid substitutions for protein, and you ask the simple question, what fraction of those retain the ability to fold in the function? So not acquire a new function, but just stay folded, because we think that that's a prerequisite for function, then that fraction changes exponentially down with amino acid substitutions, such that even after a very small fraction of amino acid substitutions, you know, 5 out of 450, maybe 1 in 100 or even fewer would still fold in function. And then such a smaller fraction of those will acquire new function. So it looks pretty ugly. A lot of biochemists and chemists and engineers will think, oh, gee, you know, proteins are fragile, right? And so I can't make amino acid substitutions for them. But obviously that's not true, because we are the products of evolution. We are the products of a process that has gone through the evolution. And really what the number to get from this is not that it goes down exponentially, but that there's a really significant number that are neutral. If, if this is the fraction that are neutral, and we have an exponential function with m being the number of amino acid changes, we're talking of a, a fraction on the order of a half. And when you think about all the ways that you can make a single amino acid substitution to a protein that's 450 amino acids long, that's 19 out of 450, or almost 9,000 ways, then a half times 9,000 still gives you many thousands of ways to make a mutation to a protein 
and still have a full encryption. So it's this very large neutral fraction that allows us uh, to move forward with acquiring new capabilities. John Maynard Smith in 1970 published a single 1.5 page long paper in Nature that I would most like to have written myself. And basically he argued that I believe we are the products of evolution and evolution has a certain nature such that for evolution to occur, I can tell you something about the distribution of functional proteins in sequence space. And in fact, the distribution has to be such that each protein is surrounded by one new neighbors, and there has to be at least one next to it for evolution to continue its walk through space. So if we think of sequence space as being all the proteins, functional proteins, and it's one new neighbor, so now they're ordered in this space with one mutation separating them, then mutation and natural selection diffuses, walks, wanders through this space, finding new functional proteins nearby, and after a long period of time, they have diffused across this network so that the 7,000 cytochrome P450s in 2008 will be related to one another eventually through all these single mutational walks. And this tells us something that functional proteins today are embedded within networks, highly uh, dense networks compared to the rest of sequence space of functional proteins. So it doesn't matter whether it's one in 10 to the 77 of functional proteins in a random space. What matters is that the products of evolution are sitting in a very functionally dense part of this space. Because that means that I can walk on this network too. All right, so uh, go back here. Uh-oh. I need my previous slide because that tells you what I actually do when I talk. means that I can actually use this idea and implement it in the laboratory through a very simple algorithm. If functional proteins are surrounded by other functional proteins through unit mutational walks, then I should be able to take any gene from 2008, incorporate a few, a small number of random mutations into it, maybe one or two amino acid substitutions per gene. I can make lots of those in a test tube put those back into cells, they do the hard thing of translating that DNA into protein. And then, from those cells, I should be able to screen for the properties of interest or select if I'm smart enough to be able to tie that to survival and reproduction. So even if I do a simple screen, then, of course, the Murphy's Law of Evolution is the vast majority don't do what you want. Uh, but if you've asked the right kind of question, where unit mutational walks give rise to incremental changes in function, then yes, there will be some small subset, maybe on the order of 10 or 5, and I can take those and repeat the process, iterating on this, and essentially doing a very simple, stupid optimization, a random uphill walk in this um, fitness landscape. And at the end of the process, either the student wants to graduate or you've fulfilled your milestones for your funding or you've actually solved the problem, then the gene will encode a protein that gives you properties that you're interested in. This is a remarkably robust strategy, strategy and I'll give you a couple of, of examples of the kinds of problems that you can solve with it. All right. Of course, as opposed to that diffusing across the network for millions of years of the cytochrome P450s, my walks in the sequence space, because our patience is limited, are very brief. Maybe we can do five, 10 generations. Um, you know, I'll tell you experiments of 23 generations. But these are very brief, and they're very directed as well. This is by no means evolution, as we normally think about it. This is selective breeding, selective breeding of molecules in the laboratory. And I decide who lives and who dies, and I decide what properties I want to have these molecules acquire. So what possible interesting function would be accessible by such a simple uh, algorithm? Well, here we can use chemical intuition. If it we're limited to a single mutation in every generation, and I have to have a measurable increase in function, then we would imagine that uh, some sorts of things that might be accessible to VM3, starting with fatty acid hydroxylase, act 
could, perhaps I could turn it into a um, alkane hydroxylase. And uh, those would be structurally close so that a single mutation would get a, a measurable improvement in function. And then if I actually wanted to do something really interesting, such as confer an activity not exhibited by the parental enzyme, then maybe I'd have to divide that problem into a series of steps, each of which could be solved by an mutational lock. So perhaps I, as a chemist, could say, OK, if I, let's say I wanted to do something crazy and make a paper study that works on methane, insert oxygen into methane, where I, I'm starting with a fatty acid, then I can go through a series of intermediate steps, each of which can be solved by unit mutational locks. Of course, you might come along and say, well, that's really stupid, because it's not just the size of the substrate that matters. Now you're actually getting into chemical uh, difficulties here, because we're also dealing with significant changes in the CH bond strength as we go to something like methane. So we're going from these internal methylene CH is all the way to about 105 kcals per mole for methane. So we're dealing with substrates that maybe uh, people in the 50s couldn't handle. And in fact, if you go to nature, you would find that there is no known naturally occurring site for people in 50 that would take uh, or is known to take gaseous alkenes like propane, ethane, or methane. Now, some people might interpret that. You, know, you see, I haven't been able to make my P450 work on propane, and I know of no propane oxidase that has a P450. Therefore, it cannot be done. That's a common response to such things in the literature. But I think that's a really interesting question, because just because we haven't yet found a P450, in fact, that problem seems to be solved by a whole other class of enzymes that are not heme oxygenases. Uh, well, it might be tempting to say it cannot be done. Maybe it's that nature never really had a reason to do it. So this nature solution to oxidizing methane, ethane, and propane are diiron enzymes that have no evolutionary or mechanistic relationship to the cytochrome p450s. This problem is solved by a very different and very complex family, which I won't go into. But it's another family you don't want to touch with a 10 foot pole because they are very difficult to work with and very difficult to engineer. So this is where I get into this question about what's fun about doing evolution in the laboratory is that, yes, if you want, you can limit yourselves to the molecules that exist today, or perhaps <coughs> existed in the past, because those are biologically relevant. But there's a whole other space of molecules out here that are physically possible at any time. That's a lot of places. It might be the cure of cancer or the energy crisis out there. And they're just not exhibited in nature because they don't solve a biological problem. But it would solve my uh, methane oxidation problem if I were able to solve that. Nature chose a different solution, apparently. But it would be nice to know whether if P450 propane hydroxylase or ethane or methane hydroxylase is a physically possible molecule. If, it's, if it is, then that brings another question, why does nature apparently choose the MMO family? Or is it just we haven't looked very hard with gaseous substrates? A lot of microbiologists don't really like working with gaseous alkanes, and perhaps you know, there's not a big effort in screening P450s for these functions, but they exist. All right, so how do you actually do this? Uh, you take old-fashioned analytical chemistry and scale it down to 96 well plates, and Matt Peters, a chemist in my group, did a wonderful job with that and came up with, with high throughput screens that give you enough information on whether something will take a substrate the size of octane or propane. Of course, the CH5 strength is very different in these, but at least it gave us a handle on the, on the substrates. Oh, by the way, the reason you can't screen on octane or propane is it's really hard to measure octanol and propanol in a complex fermentation rock. You don't want to purify your proteins. You don't want to do a lot of uh, expensive steps because that gives you a lot of noise in your screen. You just want to take the lysate, add a substrate, and get a nice color change. So if you take one of these methyl ethers, say dimethyl ether, then formaldehyde is the product of the P450 reaction, and formaldehyde in purple reagent will form a nice purple color and light up if, if that reaction goes forward. Then you can take the product, the positive clones uh, that are good on dimethyl ether, test them on by gas chromatography on propane. 
So instead of doing 3,000, you can do 3,000 here, and then you can do 10 on gas chromatography. And that's what we did. And it used an increase in the total turnover number, that is how much product you actually make with propanol, and that would be your sole criterion for accepting mutation. So I will make a long story short. This project started back in the 1990s with funding from the British Petroleum. And uh, they lost patients long before this project ended, so we keep going with it. Uh, after, so with the wild-type enzyme, it has a little bit of activity on octane. And that's always a, a first principle of doing uh, improvement by evolution. You really want to have a little bit of activity to start with so that you're not um, just praying that the result will happen. You actually have some belief that a mutation will give an improvement. So after five rounds of, and there's no activity of propane, after five rounds of this evolution process, we obtained the first decent alkane hydroxylase. And uh, it had improved activity on octane. And along with that came some promiscuous activity. Once it had learned how to have reactivity on octane, it also accepted a little bit of propane and made propanol. And of course, that was nice because we could then screen on dimethyl ether or for propane activity. And when you screen this for propane activity, you can get large improvements of activity on propane. And along with those large improvements in propane activity, also come further improvements in activity on octane. So now we're up to five or 6,000 turnovers, total turnovers. And this is a manifestation of the most important law of directed evolution, which is you get what you screen for. But then they stop. It was really not fun, and I um, thought maybe you know the students who had the project really didn't have the skills to do the screening well. Um, we were tearing our hair out. Just got no further improvement. And this often happens with these experiments. Why would things stop? Well, why would stop? Because Francis Cytomel P450 was, really does not want to do any better hydroxylating propane. Certainly not ethane. That's possible. Maybe that property is not chemically accessible by, a, it's not chemically possible. But the other thing is if, if it's not accessible by this unit mutational law. It might be chemically possible, but it's just not accessible. And what's, what turned out to be the issue was a really simple thing. The reason it wasn't accessible by unit mutational law is that you get what you screen for. We have been screening just for improvements in total turnover now. Does it oxidize more propane to propanol? But at the same time, the stability of the enzyme, as it had accepted these mutations that improve activity, it had been losing what little thermostability it had to begin with. P450s are notoriously unstable. And this wild-type enzyme had gone down to where if you're growing this thing at 37, basically hardly have any functional P450 left. So there was just nothing to, nothing to work with. And this led us to something we had understood and people had understood for a long time, but I'll tell you in a really simple way. Jesse Bloom did a really nice analysis of this problem a few years ago where he argued that if you look at all the ways that you can make a mutation, these are those 9,000 single mutations that you can make, and you look at the distribution of the effects of those mutations on the free energy of stabilization of the protein. Some of the mutations, a few, are going to make it more stable. Most of the mutations are maybe less stable, right? Mutations are deleterious. And so if you're starting with a marginal, marginally stable protein, and it has to have some critical threshold in order to be functional in its cellular milieu, then most of the mutations that you can make are going to push it over this threshold, and you're not even going to get any protein to begin with. So what's the solution? The simple solution is just to move this distribution over you stabilize the darn thing so that this whole block of mutations that was formerly inaccessible because it would just knock the protein out become accessible. Right? So more stable proteins are more evolved. They can accept more mutations and they have more opportunities to acquire the new functions. This really works. If you go and stabilize that one that was giving us all the difficulties, 35 and 11. So you go add a couple of stabilized mutations to that. We had some in our pocket, which you can find in my directed evolution. Uh, then it was very easy to move forward. 
so that with a few more generations of directed evolution, and now all hell broke loose because people got really tired of reading in Genesis and started trying every uh, every method that you can think of, identifying mutations in the active site, saturating those residues, and so um, there was a, a lot of non-random stuff going on, but I won't, I won't make the story confusing. But they were all basically single amino acid substitutions, able to increase the total turnover up to about 20,000 now. Then we have to think about another aspect of this enzyme, which is that the heme domain is but a small piece of it. The heme domain, uh, which I show here in green, is attached to this big reductase domain, which has a lot of work to do, because it's got to deliver electrons one by one to the heme through a nice shuttle of cofactors. In fact, I mean, this is a really fun machine to study. The FMN actually physically moves down to deliver the electrons to the heme. The bottom line, though, is I don't want to you with the catalytic cycle as fascinating as it is, is that when you start adding non-native substrates to this enzyme, or you make amino acid substitutions, this wonderfully finely tuned electron delivery mechanism becomes uncoupled, so that it becomes a very good NADPH oxidase. You can just chew up your expensive NADPH without any product formation. So they become uncoupled to one another. And of course, then, rather, then um, highly active oxygen species get made at the heme, and you get heme destruction after a few turnovers. So in fact, if you screen for total turnover number, you're trying to hold on to the coupling. That was one reason that we chose total turnover number as our screening criterion. But if we haven't got this whole thing tuned, and we've only been mutating the heme domain, then we're never going to get increases in total turnover. One thing I will note, though, as just by screening in the heme domain, screening for total turnover, it caused the coupling to improve on um, propane from essentially you know, very small numbers in the first propane hydroxylase all the way up to 90%. So we didn't screen directly for coupling, but it came along as a result of having a highly efficient catalyst. But really, I'd like to go and push it all the way to the limit. Can we make a P450, not that it's good in propane hydroxylase, but that as is good on propane as the wild type enzyme is on its preferred fatty acid substrates. So fully coupled, essentially 100%, 98%, and very high total turnover numbers. So we argued that, in fact, we probably should be evolving the rest of the machine. You know, it's a highly modular system, so obviously we were able to go a long way. It's just evolving this one part. But it's, a, it's also a coupled machine. So while the evolution in the heme domain was going on, we were doing parallel evolution. We did parallel evolution on the FMN and FAD binding uh, regions of the protein, uh, using improved heme domains at the same time. And the net result of doing these parallel evolutions and then recombining the optimized domains was a protein called P450 PMO. Rudy Fazan did this work over the last couple of years. B450 PMO is a really good propane hydroxylase. It has as many turnovers as you can measure in a, in a small assay, and it goes for much longer than 45,000 in a whole cell system. Its equal, initial rate of reaction, 300 per minute, is as good as any um, alkene hydroxylase out there, and it is 98% coupled with cofactor consumption to product formation. So we got a further two-fold increase from the best heme domain, uh, TP450 PMO. And it's interesting to compare the rates of the catalytic rates of this enzyme to the first propane hydroxylase. Remember, wild type has no measurable activity in propane. So we had to look at one of the evolutionary intermediates. K cat over K has 8,000-fold improved. Uh, K KM has been reduced to 180-fold and in fact is comparable to the KM of wild type EM3 Amore, one of its preferred substrates, so that's about 300 micromolar. KCAT is also um, comparable. So it's a, it's a it, for P450, it's a good P450. And just to show those numbers again, for BM3, it's very good on lorate, but not measurable on propane. PMO, very good on propane, 
and in fact has lost its activity on borate. So now there's been almost a 10 to the 10th fold change in the specificity of this enzyme over this process. Great thing about the traditional laboratory, you've got the whole fossil record. So I've got all these intermediates in the refrigerator, and if I've got somebody who's got the wherewithal, they'll go back and look at what happened during this process. So now I get to share that story with you, and this has not yet been published. Rudy Fazan took the wild type enzyme and looked at its activity on alkanes of everything from methane to C10 and showed that, and here what I'm doing is I'm um, normalizing the activity with respect to the alkane on which it has the highest activity. So 100% just means that of all the alkanes, BM3 likes decane the most. And then it has very, very low activity, no measurable activity on propane, for example. Very low on octane, but that's where we started the process. And as you go to the first alkane hydroxylase, the 1393, you can see that it now has preference for the medium chain alkane, a little less for decane, and uh, just barely measurable on C3. And then as you go further in the process, you can see what's happening. As you go and accumulate these mutations, it's broadening out. This is the one that's very unstable, but it accepts just about everything. And then accumulating more mutations, that is improving the total turnover number on propane, is starting to push the specificity over to the small alkanes. So that right now at 11.3, there's no longer any measurable activity on um, decking. And then further, going on, you can see that it's pushing it down, pushing it down, such that in P450 PMO, this enzyme has now essentially re-specialized. It has no measurable activity on borate, no fatty acid, but it even has no measurable activity on the longer alkanes. So now, just by pushing on the activity of propane, it is now hardly takes butane, certainly not pentane, and of course, it sadly has no activity on methane. So it's gone through this series of promiscuous intermediates, things that have much broader specificity than the wild type, and then gone to probing. And furthermore, this was all done under positive selection alone. So I think this is an important principle. A lot of people think that you need to have negative selection on top of positive selection in order to re-specialize something. But this shows that if you don't wait long enough, that's really true. But if you keep pushing it, at least with the P450, to have activity in propane, that specialization came along as uh, accompanying the process. So I thought you might enjoy seeing where the mutations lie. Um, there's 23 total mutations in P450. 20 are in the heme domain, P450 PMO. 20 are in the uh, heme domain. They're distributed a lot throughout the protein. There's a lot in the active site because we started getting uh, impatient and pushing mutations into the active site. So a lot of these were in the, these out here came in the early generations. Uh, we know that they're functional because when removed, they remove the activity towards propane, but we really have very little idea of what the outside mutations are doing. But I'll show you this cool little movie that Tom Lewis made from the crystal structures of BM3 with its substrate bound. This is a fatty acid substrate. Substrate bound, and then in the open conformation with no substrate. And as I say, this is just a cartoon with the crystal structures of these two um, conformations. But you can see that it undergoes a significant conformational change in order to bind the substrate and uh, get rid of water from the active site. A lot of those mutations that I showed you are sitting in this FG helix region that has to close down and open things. So there's there's quite a bit of, I mean, it's very important what the sequence of this region is. Now, this shouldn't scare anybody, any would-be designers, because these are the, the very good um, demonstration of details in that, and we don't understand the details. We would have very difficult time identifying which mutations here would affect this in a way that would allow it to accept propane. Also, here's some interesting analysis. Uh, comparing wild type, we do have a crystal structure of one of the intermediates. Tom Lewis's lab did the crystal structure of 139.3, and that has almost half of the mutations in PMO, so we're quite a bit along the evolutionary line. From that crystal structure, we can make a good model of P450 PMO. And I'll just show you the change in the volume of the substrate binding site as we go from wild type 
towards PMO. Let's say this is long, but we think it's a pretty good one. Uh, as the promiscuous, it becomes more promiscuous. We see maybe a slight increase in the volume of the, of the uh, vitamin site, but a distinct compartmentalization and compaction of that. In fact, it's quite interesting. There's a, a glutamic acid that gets placed in here along with the phenylalanine that seems to cut off part of the binding pocket. Remember, we're going after propane now, so it seems to have come up with a nice solution of actually just dividing the binding pocket in two so that it, it has become significantly smaller. All right, so what have we done? We've now invaded the functional territory that was previously thought to belong only to members of this MMO-like family, propane monooxygenase, butane monooxygenases. It's clear that a P450 does this and does it very well. The, at least the initial rates are fully comparable to the natural enzymes working on these small substrates. Furthermore, along with this activity on propane, comes a little promiscuous activity on ethane. So we can start this story all over again. Ten years isn't long enough. But for the chemists in the audience, here I've got a catalyst that does the direct air oxidation of ethane to ethanol. 2,700 turnover numbers. Air, room from one atmosphere. This is the best ethane hydroxylation catalyst that anyone has ever recorded. And I couldn't get it published. Everybody said, uh, everybody knows that enzymes can do that. That's not that interesting. So it's not fair. This is a really good ethane hydroxylase. But it's, and it's fully good enough to get it um, to do it direct, direct evolution directly on ethane. So the next story that I'm going to tell you next year, if I come back, would be how you can make this ethane hydroxylase just as good on ethane as um, the wildcat is on, or as its parent is on propane. And you have to do that by actually not going under. There is no ethane surrogate. You actually have to screen for ethanol activity. That's really hard in a fermentation drop, let me tell you. But you can do that directly in these cute little Cimex 96 well reactors, and um, we've determined some nice colorimetric assays for ethanol, so that really works. But I will tell you, we're well on the way to methane, because if you look at halo methanes, um, this enzyme, PMO, has activity on all three of these halo methanes, including iodomethane whose CH bond strength is now 103. No one knew that P450 could do this. Not even MMO, MMO has been reported to do this reaction, so that's actually a new uh, specificity both for MMOs and uh, P450s, and we're really pushing the CH bond strength um, significantly up. So my guess is it can do methane pretty perfectly well, but it's just finding right, uh, finding pocket configuration to hold methane in there. So. That's the open question we're going to go. Let me finish by going in totally the opposite direction. Because tomorrow I'm going to tell you a lot about larger <coughs> drug-like substrates. Because this is really interesting. This is where the, I guess, where the money is in P450 chemistry. Because humans have P450. They're involved in drug interactions and drug metabolism. And it would be really <coughs> nice to have P450s that would mimic uh, human metabolism. Remember. This enzyme, as it went to PMO, went through a series of promiscuous intermediates. Well, it turns out if you take one of those promiscuous intermediates and you start screening it for activity on different compounds, or screening mutants of that enzyme for activity on different compounds, you can find all sorts of interesting activities. And I'm just going to tell you two before I uh, stop. In a collaboration with Chi Wei Wang's group at, uh, and Will Greenberg at Scripps, We've been looking at the selective demethylation of permethylated sugars. That is, fully, de fully protected sugars to see if we can selectively deprotect at different positions along the sugar molecule. If you can do that with P450s, this is a demethylation like the dimethyl ether demethylation. Mixed formaldehyde, you can screen it colorimetrically, so you can add these permethylated sugars to these P450 reactions. You see nice purple color. It's active on that. You can run it through the GC and see what the region of selectivity is. If you can do that, then you can do further chemistry. You can de make deoxy sugars. You can um, do glycosylation selectively. And this is a single step reaction. Really, really nice. Well, let me tell you, it works extremely well. This is just one example for your enjoyment. This is once again unpublished. Where you take permethylated benzyl galactose and run it across a, just a select panel of P450s. 
you can find ones that give quantitative conversion at every single one of the positions. And here's just one of the examples. These are selected, perfectly selected for demethylation at the fourth position of this substrate. And in fact, under the right conditions, you can make milligram quantities easily of this with significantly high yields. So this opens up a whole set of possibilities for um, new sugar synthesis. Makes it really easy. Human metabolites are interesting. So we published this a couple of years ago already. We can take the mutants of these enzymes that take substrates significantly different from propane and make the authentic human metabolites. So here are six hydroxybuspiron. This is a marketed drug for anxiety and depression. And what's interesting is that the human metabolite is the biologically active one. It's more active than the drug itself. And so it would be really nice to be able to have the human metabolite, uh, especially in new drugs, drug leads. So we showed that we could find easily find a mutant that made exactly the right stereoselectivity, the right product, right regioselectivity, and had a decent conversion without any optimization. Eli Lilly was so excited about these results that they came to us with three of their drugs and said, you know, we know that these have something like 50 or 39 human metabolites. We know what they are. Run it across your panels and tell us what you have. Uh, we looked at verapamil, estamazole, and one of their unmarketed drug compounds. And within a week, we were able to deliver them more than 30 um, authentic human metabolites as well as some inauthentic metabolites, which is perhaps even more interesting. Each one of these costs about $50,000 to synthesize in milligram quantities. And these enzymes made all of these, including these novel metabolites not made in microsomal systems or with cloned human enzymes. Didn't make a few of them, we missed them because we didn't look very far. And some of these enzymes are very selective, allowing easy scale up to make individual metabolites. So one of the enzymes just selected this methyl group from all the other ones, you got five methyl groups and selected this one. So 94 selectivity and could easily make 10 milligrams. That was so exciting that they begged us to start a company. I'm not the least bit interested in starting a company at this point. And so I licensed them to Codexis. This is a great supplier of enzymes to, in synthesis. And they're now marketing uh, from Caltech this Microsoft platform uh, for these being three. So it's actually a really, it's, I'm not just announcing this, um, the, I've, I, these are really useful, um, really useful catalysts that are now available for these kinds of syntheses. So with that, I'm going to thank two of the people who really contributed recently to this work. Andrew Savayan did all the metabolite work, and Rudy Kazan has done these amazing studies on the P450 BMO and then a few other people in the lab. And Al, at this point, thank you very much for having me here. So that's a, the general question is, if you do it again, 
or you take a different walk, we you get the same result? I'm sure if I even use the same selective pressures, I wouldn't get the same result. There are obviously many solutions to this problem. Otherwise, it wouldn't have it, right? There was only one solution. I'm not doing exhaustive screening. I'm doing a few thousand clones. That's a very small fraction of all the possibilities. I don't think that, you know, this, the, what I'm doing here is historical, and I'm quite sure that you can start and find this by a less secure route. We're now actually doing computationally designed libraries and screening on dimethyl ether and have plenty that have three or four mutations that work on dimethyl ether. So, you know, you can do it all. You can skin that evolutionary cat in lots of ways. Yeah, evolution's great, isn't it? <laughs>
And therefore, you have this nice dynamic range of 10 to 100 percent where mutations can be measured. If you, if you make it too unstringent, the parent will be too close to the ceiling, and you don't have enough dynamic range of the measurement. And if you've taken it too far, you can't measure parent anymore, and you don't know whether you're five mutations away or 10. So that's how you do it. You do it by looking at what the parent does. It's not black magic. It's actually really science. <laughs> So there is no known natural propane monooxygen. And of course, since I've only made 23 mutations, who's it going to be most similar to? It's going to be similar to BM3. So it has not converged towards any other sequence. That's the closest sequence to BM3 is, what, 70% identical. So it has 120-some amino acid substitutions. So it certainly hasn't gone towards anything that we know of. And in general, they don't converge to other sequences. They don't actually, because they have too many pathways to go from one sequence to the other. The probability that you'll converge on any known thing is essentially zero. And that's a good thing, because that would, what it means is there's, for any given problem, there's lots and lots of solutions. Right? There have to be. Let's do one more question, and then we'll head over for refreshments. So as a sort of a follow-up, are the positions that you're seeing the mutations in, are those the ones that tend to vary a lot between different monooxygenases, or are they the more conserved ones, or how does that relate? So you can get more, that's a good question, and you can get more information from the positions of mutations, because now you, you really are getting the adaptive mutations. And so people, are 50s, people have analyzed the hell out of these things, because they're so important to drug development. And they've identified these substrate rec recognition sites. So half our mutations fall in these substrate recognition sites, which account for about half the sequence, and half of them don't. Does that give me any additional information? It tells me that, you know, we're right randomly half the time. I mean, it doesn't really give us a huge clue as to where you'd go if you were going to design this thing. Um, however, we have taken what we've learned about what doesn't work, right? So you can throw out all the sites that are always going to kill the protein. Um, and we've taken things where we see multiple hits, and we can make design libraries from those. So if you choose five residues, then the sequence space is really very small. And you can make all those <coughs> substitutions at all five simultaneously and ask, do any of these hydroxylate, dimethyl ether? And the answer is yes. So we can actually, based on what we get from random intergenesis, design libraries computationally, you know, I mean, design libraries, not even computationally, and um, tar start targeting mutations with some success. Super. Let's, let's move all of our questions over.